think that, that God has given us this feeling as perceivable as romance, this passion as um, perceivable as sex, and this institution as diabolical and as painful as marriage can be, and has told us absolutely nothing? Do you just get married and uh, God just kind of tosses it to you like a grenade and says, well, fiddle around with it, you'll figure out how to work with it. <laughs> Do you think he's, if this indeed, like Peter said, that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness and the true knowledge of him who called us, with my need of romance, my passion, my sex drive, with marriage, does he tell us anything? Yes, he does. As a matter of fact, he gives us an entire book in the Wisdom Books, and it's called the Song of Solomon. It has the distinction of being the only book that is edited and that is censored by the Christian church. Most of you don't read it, you don't understand it, much less would you ever hear it preached on. You're going to watch him have sex in the book twice. And friend, it will make you sweat to see it. I kid you not, I was teaching this book once in the Theta Chi fraternity house of the University of North Texas. This is the truth. And I was at one of the steamier portions of the book. And this guy in the front row does like this. And that's what I've always felt about the Song of Solomon. I love to teach this to little old ladies. What do you think that means, ladies? I really don't know. I'll tell you what it means. Incidentally, let me do a little preaching right here. This is why it's so hard to find a commentary on the Song of Solomon, because we all think that God is so mystic and the holy other that he doesn't know what passion is. Where do you think we got passion from and desire from? We got it from God. We think sometimes we say, God, help me deal with my lust. You're what? what? Help me. What? What's lust? No, he knows what it is. And that's why the book is so often taught in allegory as Christ to the church, because we can't imagine this being real. You see, a bad date costs you a little time, money, and an annoyance. But courtship, when you have a bad courtship, that costs you a little bit of your soul. It's kind of like uh, if you were to, to see somebody on a sub-zero day taking their tongue and putting it to a flagpole. <laughs> and you would say, friend, that is an ill-designed and an uncommon union, and you're not going to get out of that without leaving a little part of you <laughs> on that flagpole. Well, that's kind of what courtship is. When you get married and go to your honeymoon, you don't want to just have a honeymoon that's business as usual. You want to turn around, guys, and see that woman and go, Song. Sex. We don't talk about it. Where do we not talk about it? We don't talk about it in church. Well, where do you talk about it? In the home? No. How many of you did not discuss with your parents about sex. Would you raise your hands if you did not discuss? You just kind of figured it out on the Exxon wall, all right, like the rest of us did. <laughs> you don't talk about it in church. You don't talk about it in, in the home. Where do you talk about it? School? No, we forbid talking about it in school. And yet a great many of you have great big chunks that have been taken out of you by sex. Some of you have been maimed, and all of us know somebody that has been cost dearly by sex, but we don't talk about it, even though you have in the Bible the Song of Solomon with eight chapters, and two chapters let you watch a couple make love. Don't ask how far can you go when you're dating. You ask the question, how far can we keep away from it? How close can we walk to the edge of the canyon, mummy? No, let's stay away from it and just look. The point is, all couples fight. Good couples fight clean. Bad couples fight dirty. Good couples press to a resolution. Bad couples press for a victory. Good couples, when they conflict, it exposes their character. A bad couple, when they conflict, it exposes their immaturity. All couples conflict. Do you see from the Bible how to conflict? Don't react. Respond. Let God change them. Talk. 
forgive and forget. And this is why they come to you and they say, don't get married. Married couples will say this. This is why they come to me 20 years into marriage and they end up divorcing. Because they end up going into lukewarmness, then they build their marriage on the kids. The kids graduate, they look across the table and say, who are you? What bothers a woman is when a man does not reinforce his love by affection until he is sexually aroused. And now she feels hustled and prostituted and abased. You grant your wife affection. So no matter what you say, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's how you interpret not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. But when you get married, you're not merely going to give just your yes or your no. You, that will be the only time maybe your entire life, unless you do an oath for the system of jurisprudence, that you will swear, so help me God. You will swear upon each of the persons of the Trinity. And my friend, you do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You do not shout cut through the institution of marriage. Who was it that providentially took care of her body? God. Who brought her husband into her path? God. Why is this text here? Because contextually and exegetically, it is talking about the art of commitment. Why are you committed to your wife until the day you die? Why is your final act as a husband? Either to make sure you bestow all of your insurance on that woman as you die. That's the way it is. That's why whenever I go to old folks' homes and speak, I always speak to about 30 bright, chipper ladies and one guy who don't know where he is.